Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 199, Science Faction Paranthropus Boise Eye. Boy, was this discovered in America's Paris, Boise, Idaho? <laughs> I didn't think you were going with that. I thought because of your predilections, you would mention boys. But no, no, it was not discovered in boys. I'm not going to get Kevin Spacey. Okay, I don't want years <laughs> from now people making allegations. I want them to give them no ammunition. <laughs> of course, our new intro bit is different hominins over time. We've gone through the very, very earliest ones, in through the Australopithecines, and now to the Paranthropus genus, which is, of course, it used to be considered part of Australopithecines, con- called the robust Australopithecines, and these are now contemporaneous with our own genus Homo. This is contemporaneous with Homo habilis, even some of the early Homo erectus, and the reason that's important is because now we're getting into what we've described before as that Lord of the Rings type world of early hominins where you had multiple species living in one place. The giants lived over here and the dwarfs lived over there and the humans lived over there. You can't say dwarf, can you? (laughs) It's dwarf every time. You just lack the ability. I do, I do. So at what point in the story do we create Urukai in in real life? Uh, I think that was around Homo heidelbergensis. That's that's when we started breeding the Neanderthals and the Homo sapiens together. That's when you got We are Urukai. We inherited the earth. (laughs) Deep, deep thoughts, Damien. So these Paranthropus, again, they're very thick, very robust. They have big heads, still have the sagittal crest along the top, which anchors really large chewing muscles to molars that are four times the size of ours. Huge molars. In fact, this particular Paranthropus, Boisei, was the largest of the Paranthropus genus. It also had the biggest teeth, the biggest chewing muscles. When originally found, it was actually labeled Nutcracker Man because the paleoanthropologists who were studying it thought, what are you going to use these huge teeth with these huge muscles for? And their best explanation was uh, nuts and tubers. We now think, because of some residue analysis work that we do, that in fact, this particular species spent a lot of time eating grasses, seeds, and that kind of thing. May have also had some nuts in there as well, but basically had these big, giant, grinding teeth for processing that type of food. For this reason, do you think that they were the only hominid species who, if you were a parent, you'd prefer your child become a dentist as opposed to a doctor? Yeah. There was more money in it. (laughs) That's right, because they they had the much larger teeth. They were much more important. And they would get ground down a lot as well. And they also had very, very thick tooth enamel as well, which means we can even tell this species when we find little fragments of their teeth because they're so different from the rest of ours. Not only did it share time with the Homo genus, meaning it was around at the same time, it also shared space. They were around in the same area, which makes it very confusing when we find stone tools in the layer that these creatures lived because we can't be 100% sure whether it came from Paranthropus or that Homo genus. But very, very interesting because it appears by all intents that this species eventually went extinct. This genus went extinct. There was essentially a dead evolutionary end, whereas Homo kept going to the modern day. This particular species and this genus kind of dwindled out. But it would be very interesting to see them alive because unlike the gracile Australopithecines, we talked about Lucy, Afarensis, Anamensis, Africanus, all of those kind of look like they were leading to us. They, they kind of had a more homotype body, really thin, lithe, was kind of meant for moving around a savanna in that sense. These things are almost like you would cross a gorilla with one of those older hominins. Very, very thick, big, prominent skulls, big jaws. These things would look much scarier. They'd be much more intimidating if you saw them openly, which again is funny because as we just talked about, they were clearly herbivores. Gorillas are too, but I'm still terrified right. of them. I mean, granted, I've only had to kill four or five gorillas That's in single <laughs> combat with bare hands in my life. Yeah, you are literally the only person who has gotten banned from a country for hunting at the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great, but I'd kind of like to be referred to as... Al Borland to your Tim the Toolman Taylor. I could see that. You do wear a lot of flannel. And you did sexually harass Pamela Anderson to the point where she is no longer on the show. <laughs> is that a fact? <laughs> did Richard Kern sexually harass? Wow, this is the first interesting information I've learned on this podcast. All right. And we have a new science guest host this afternoon. Bill. Bill, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. I just completed some yoga and ate a big lunch and had a satisfying bowel movement. Well, that, 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 is, that is the trifecta of satisfying things to do during a Science Faction podcast. I'm honored that we have such a productive co-host. Most people do that while listening to this podcast. Uh, that's why there's the hole in the seat. That's right. Bill, uh, why don't you explain what your specialty is? 
Uh, I do uh, acousto fluidics, mm-hmm. uh, which is uh, using horrible um, band name. Yep. Yep. Uh-huh. <laughs> Which is using uh, non-audible sound waves to move fluids around. Mm-hmm. Then, do you think like the non-audible sound waves are somewhat disappointed in themselves, or at least their parents are, that they didn't get to the point where they could actually be heard by others? I, I like to think of it more like uh, the non-audible sound waves are AI, mm-hmm. and the audible ones are are humans. Mm-hmm. So really, they you don't see them or hear them. Uh, right. The analogy, but but they're much more useful and uh, less constrained to. Uh, the physical reality. Now, you're doing your PhD research on this particular topic, correct? I am. Uh, were you bombarded a couple months ago with questions regarding what the Cubans were doing to all of our uh, people in the embassy there? I was not. Okay. Did because you hear about you this did story? It. I didn't. Can you enlighten me? So this is a really interesting one that came out where we actually came close to declaring war on Cuba, but essentially removed all of our ambassadors because we believed that the Cubans were using a, a non-audible sonic weapon against them. Then they caused permanent brain damage to the ambassadors and the families of the ambassadors that were there during the time. We're still not sure what the weapon was or how it works, but because of a few clues, they basically determined that it was a non-audible sound source that was used to literally really damage the brains of a lot of the the people working at that embassy. Could it have been a continuous, sustained, very high octave Roomba? Yeah. (laughs) It was actually the Macarena, just played on repeat at really, really high speed. This is just like, like small children in a classroom like communicating with each other via high frequency mm-hmm. buzzes yeah just screeches the, the adults hear. can't hear it yeah it's that's still right. fucking up their hearing exactly they can't hear it yeah my, my favorite version of that because there are basically your ability to hear certain frequencies dwindles over time and there are frequencies that young people can hear that adults can't and they play these frequencies loudly at malls where they don't want kids loitering so that the kids can't sit there and stand it I for have a long heard time. that so apparently there are frequencies that only Cubans can yeah. hear now <laughs> no 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 they were American American diplomats in Cuba oh, that they I used see. on them. I see. Okay. But yeah, it's actually it was a it was a huge story. There's still some controversy as to whether or not that was actually the cause or whether it was an intentional cause. You know, there's a lot of unintentional stuff that have, happens with infrared. My favorite is it's a famous one recounted by Sam Harris. A group of people in a lab actually started experiencing hallucinations that seemed like a ghost, and they thought that the lab was haunted, and it became a big deal because people weren't just saying, "Hey, I kind of feel this is haunted." They're like, "I saw a fucking ghost. There's a ghost here," and these are reasonable, rational scientists but again because they're reasonable rational scientists they don't just run out screaming instead they actually started kind of dismantling what the possibility was and they found out that it was a fan an industrial lab fan that had been emitting a frequency that actually activated the part of their brain that sees uh, visual things within a, a hallucinogenic concept and made them think they were seeing things based on a frequency that was being transmitted out of a broken fan describe a haunted fan in many ways but i mean you could, you could take the magic out of it or leave it there but the end effect is still so some people think that this cuban thing is actually just a, a complete accident that ended up happening though uh, i think the cia is pretty sure that it was on purpose the cia is also pretty sure that two piglets are very important to go after Have you heard about that story no so there what there's a farm that basically manufactures pigs okay uh they live very horrible lives so this well first of all i think a lot of farms manufacture pigs sure but rather than raise (laughs) okay is so this this animal rights group went in and stole two pigs Mm -hmm. uh very small pigs Um, oh that's right yeah (laughs) and and so now the cia fbi have gone after them yeah multiple times made arrests and then it exposed the conditions of the place that they were they were right. going to. Yeah, kind of Streisand effect on that one. Is the CIA protecting the economy, the pork economy? Is that- <laughs> exactly. I mean, no joke. I think that's what's going on. Uh, and if you want to see what else is going on, go ahead and check out our website, www.thesciencefaction.com, for all the articles we cover here, as well as some we don't get to. And please make sure you tell a friend. We've seen our numbers jumping up recently. That means a bunch of you are doing that job. We really, really appreciate it. We charge nothing for this podcast, and we just hope that you tell people if you like it, especially those science nerdy types that might enjoy listening. Uh, We've seen our recent subscriber numbers shoot way up, and we are really, really appreciative to all of you guys who are sharing that. Thank you so much. uh, Feel free to hit subscribe and leave a message on iTunes or whatever medium. Feel free to leave outlandish requests, and we'll see what we can do on on air. Yeah, like I would like Damien to finally win a game of I Call BS. I know I, this is an outlandish request, but please, if he could try and put some effort into it every now and again. I'd like for Bobby to open up free and open elections for the people of Science Factionia. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. 
This week's science articles has a theme, Damien, and it's drugs! Thank you for finally not doing a goddamn archaeological article for once. <laughs> but it is getting off of drugs. And I can't help. Yeah, I know. All right, our first article, Recovery or BS? Very, very interesting study. It's gonna, actually going to be the basis for many studies to come, and there's a good reason why, which is we don't have a lot of information on certain types of addiction and the broad spectrum of addiction recovery. So... This is a first-of-its-kind, large-scale study looking at recovery from drugs and alcohol. We've seen a lot of small studies looking at drugs and alcohol, but they're looking at recovery populations. This is a random sample of the whole population of the United States that then looks at addiction and then the subset of people who have gotten over their addiction, so to speak, however you want to word that. So this is really interesting because we're actually seeing a broad end number. We're seeing certain effect populations, and we're seeing really, really large numbers. In this case, 55 5,000 was the uh, the first population. I think they actually sent it out to 40,000 individuals. Their response was just over half. There's a bunch of stuff that makes this study really interesting and for the first time ever because nothing like this has been done. That's what's really interesting. Nothing like this has been done in terms of addicts, addiction recovery, and those type of questions. This is our first ability to look at, at a population that theoretically is not already tainted by the subgroup that they're in. Now, we're going to find out as we go on that that's not 100% the case, still these numbers are really, really interesting. Did they cover just opioid addicts, or did they include, no. like, chocoholics? Yeah, it, chocoholics, cockaholics. <laughs> <laughs> Don't cure me. Yeah. I'm not going to a meeting. <laughs> they did. It's actually a, a good question. Despite that, they did look at a variety of different substances that these people were addicted to. Now, a couple of things to think of. This isn't experimental. This is not done in a lab. This is a survey. So you are getting responses from people. That leads to a few things. One is response bias, which we all know that certain people are only going to respond to questions that are asked. They already have certain predispositions based on their status vis-a-vis -vis that question. Number two, people lie. So it, there's nothing that's making sure that what you're saying is accurate. We have to keep those in mind. Both consciously and unconsciously. Right. right? So they, they could be just not very aware of their own state, or they sure. could be purposefully saying the wrong thing. Yeah, like, I'm not a drunk. I just drink all the time. <laughs> or you can go the other way. Maybe you're a kid trying to fit in. It's like, I do way more opioids. I, I'm, I'm high right now. So for this study, they looked at almost 40,000 participants and, were, and they were asked, did you used to have a problem with drugs or alcohol, but no longer do? More than 25,000 people answered the question. So right away, we have response bias. That's what you should be thinking when you hear those numbers. That means 15,000 people decided not to even answer that question. We can't say that that's a random segregation. So it might not be that a random group of 15,000 decided not to answer the question. It might be that if you have an addiction or have had an addiction, you are less or more likely to ignore this question. That's automatically a response bias, and it should clue us off. But that doesn't mean we throw these results out the window. So let's keep going. 25,000 panel members answered the question. And just over 2,000 of them indicated they had overcome AOD problems or some kind of addiction problems. And about 9% of those responding were sent the link to the full study. Some of those did not respond completely or responded in a way that, said, that suggested they didn't really have an addiction problem. They probably just, they were like Damien. They liked cock. They weren't addicted. <laughs> Listen, I can get up and go to work every day. Yeah, I have a cock fix in the morning, but I don't let it affect my work. I'm not sneaking out to get cock on my lunch break. They had just over 2,000 responses for the actual analysis. So here is what was really interesting. 46% of those respondents kicked the problem without any formal help. Meaning, they said, I used to be an addict, I no longer am, I did not go through their, and they break up the treatment types, you have the type that's like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, then you have ones that are like medical intervention, things like medical rehab, that kind of thing, um, and there was a, a few other su smaller subcategories, but 46% said, no, I didn't do anything. I, I just stopped drinking or I stopped and using drugs. 46% out of the people that they confirmed really did have a problem yep. and it really did kick it. Yep. And so that is a huge number because most of the time when we talk about addiction recovery, you'll hear this over and over again, you're only going to get sober in a program, you need help, this kind of thing. This is suggesting that up to half people, and again, we have to keep that response bias in place and the fact that these people are answering questions you know, freely, not necessarily accurately. If that is true, half of people kicking the habit, doing so without any help is a huge number. And it really overturns a lot of the thinking when it comes to addiction recovery. 
it means that maybe it's not necessarily these programs that are successful. It is the time that the person's going through it. Now, this is going to be on an individual basis and a person-by-person basis. And some of the interesting things about it are the breakdowns, which include the fact that a lot of the people who did go to programs, they went to AA, they went to NA, they tended to have more severe addictions. So their addictions were to substances like opiates. They had stronger addictions. The people who tended to kick it on their own tended to have addictions to lower class drugs like cannabis, other things like that. Chocohol. Chocohol, indeed. And so maybe it might be that uh, when you have addictions to opiates or other really strong drugs or very strong addictions, that those programs are much more useful for you. If you don't, if you are maybe on the lighter side of your addiction light, so to speak, uh, that you, you might be better off or at least able to do it on your own. So how did they quantify the severity of the addiction? I believe it was by the amount that you utilized and then also the consequences to your life. So a common uh, indicator of addiction, how it's gauged a lot in lab settings is, does it have negative consequences to your life? Because theoretically, I know bartenders who drink every day. They literally, they drink every day because they're at a bar. People buy them a shot because they're the bartender and stuff. But those guys can stop drinking for two months and it doesn't bother them. It's just part of their lifestyle. Then there are alcoholics who don't necessarily drink every day, but they've lost jobs because of it. They've lost family members, that kind of stuff. So I think consequences to your life is usually more important than general consumption, though general consumption is a good indicator as well. And what's interesting about this is, A, it turns on its head the idea that you necessarily need those, but B, it brings up an idea that's really murky in the scientific world, and it's something that we should talk about but talk about skeptically, which is the effectiveness of certain programs like AANA. I happen to have family members who AA has helped dramatically. You know, they, they had a problem. They are now in this program. Their continued involvement in this program keeps them sober, according to them, and I have to trust them on what they say. So, and that, I don't want Dick anymore either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. I wouldn't believe that. <laughs> Not trusting that one. So, so there are people who very genuinely seem to get a benefit from it. However, with that being said, and without trying to dissuade anybody from seeking treatment if they think they need it, because they absolutely should... It should be noted that repeated scientific studies seem to suggest that programs like AA are exactly as effective as just deciding to quit. So that people who go off on their own or that make other kind of arrangements that don't go through these programs, they tend to have the same success rate. And that AA tends to kind of fudge the numbers on their own success rates to make them seem successful, including doing things like counting anybody who drinks as not being in the program. So you relapse and drink and they go, ah, that guy wasn't really in the program. So then we're not going to count his numbers as a relapse. Because of that, it's really interesting because it seems like maybe programs like AAA really help a certain subset of people. They like help. The, the type of addict who wants to pick up Christianity while he's kicking. Sometimes, and that is a big problem. A lot of people who are secular have found problems with AAA because there is, you know, the theistic aspect to it. And a lot of times we see that people with atheist tendencies don't do well in those those type of programs. Sorry, we, we're not, we don't specialize in helping smart people quit their habits. <laughs> so this is like kind of an interesting subset. It seems to say that there are some groups that will benefit from AA, there are others that will not, and that there's at least a 50% chance that you can quit just as easily without a program if you're really determined to quit on your own. So what does that mean when we start looking at things like mandatory sentencing, where we will a judge will actually sentence somebody to one of these programs? I mean, if you're sentencing somebody to a program that's not been shown to be scientifically effective, doesn't that kind of get into a gray area of putting somebody in a re-education camp that is not necessarily directly tied to what they've done wrong, you know, if you have a DUI or something like that? Has a judge ever sentenced somebody to like one of those pray away the gay camps? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think Michelle Bachman's husband tried a few times, yeah. but I don't know if he ever, uh, ever got that oh, successful. the recidivism right in this place is insane. <laughs> I feel like he'd be psyched about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to go be back with all those closeted homos. Oh, fooey. <laughs> So it's interesting that this intersection with previous research showing that a lot of times these programs aren't really effective or they're just as effective as people who aren't in the programs in terms of their effectiveness rate. It's interesting that this kind of seems to coincide with that idea that maybe these programs, they're certainly not the be all and end all. We can say that for sure, because if half the people are getting better without it. But also, maybe we need to start broadening what these programs can do. Maybe we need a bigger spectrum of available programs that will target these people who are not well-served by things like AA or NA. You can make a strong argument that a judge would have 
more effect on addiction by sentencing somebody to joining the Marines, where they That's will true. make the decision for you That's to quit true. opiates. It'll take it out of your hands. I think that actually happens quite a bit. <laughs> really? Can you just like say get arrested? Like I woke up and I was in the Marines. I was woke up in boot camp. Are they they in like the the middle of the country? I believe they do sentence people to the military. I think it's I think it's like you can go to jail or enlistment can be a punishment or a reward. That's on you. Very, very interesting, and I do think that like, when it comes to addiction recovery, it's funny because it's hard to fault a programs that seem to have such success, that seem to have these people who are shining examples of their success. At the same time, sometimes these numbers make me think, I wonder if it's just the people. Those people would have been successful regardless. This happens to be the method by which they find it. No fault there. Keep doing that, that program if it helps you out. But I wonder if what that means is, wow, we really need to find something. If this only uh, if their effectiveness rate is like 8% in AA, when you do all the adjustments for, for everything, like their actual effectiveness is about 8%, which is about what happens when people just decide they want to quit. We need to try and serve the other 92% of people. And if programs like AA aren't doing it, programs like NA, which are famously run by Scientologists in many, many cases, um, aren't doing it, and you have these religious conflicting factors, maybe we need a broader spectrum. And there are things like uh, secular sobriety, which deals, like we said, with atheists, but maybe there's a whole nother game plan where you have to say, hey, all of these type of programs only service this very, very narrow segment of the population. We need, I don't know, like petting zoo programs. I don't know, something will, there's got to be other ways that will help the rest of the population the other 92 percent of us get off get off whatever drugs we're on is there a pharmacological solution like i know i know there's that pill you could take that if you drink alcohol right. it'll make you violently yep. ill is there and a- there's now there's there's similar things we have with opiates uh very similar uh, so we just need a batman vigilante type character to go yeah. blow dart addicts. there's also one for heroin i believe i believe if so yeah you, you take it and then it keeps heroin's you, effect i think right no no so if you if you then shoot up with heroin it has no effect Yes, yeah, that's so, what I mean. So you, you don't get the high that yeah. you're seeking when you take the drug, so it reduces... Is that a one-time dose thing, or is that... It's, no, it's, a, a, it's a one-time dose that lasts for, like, a certain Yeah, I think it lasts a month. Time. I think it's, like, a monthly or maybe a, maybe even two months or something like but that. But I think they calibrated it so that it lasted long enough so that if you shot up in that time, mm. it reduced your desire to yeah. do heroin enough that you wouldn't repeat. Well, and the, the hard part about that is it doesn't kill your ability to feel heroin. It knocks it down 15-fold. So you essentially get 1 15th the effect. So one of the problem is then addicts will hit a whole bunch of heroin. And because the effectiveness of that blocking can vary uh, you know, by a factor of two sometimes, you can then have accidental overdoses with people using 30 times the amount of heroin they used to use to try and get the same high. I got nothing. That's tragic. I don't know why you want me to make light of this. I I wanted to mention that there is an analogy between this study and then sort of like uh, individualized medicine Mm -hmm. kind of thing. So maybe, and this is kind of why this study is so exciting, is that um, maybe we will be able to tease apart what factors in a person makes them more susceptible to this treatment rather than the other treatment. And then we can, rather than just randomly throwing a bunch of darts and seeing which people who are the darts in this case. You come in and you take a blood scan and a survey test about your childhood. And then then you you take the treatment that will statistically give you a much better chance of quitting. And I would be really interested to to know what those factors are. Like, I want to know, is that mainly nature or nurture? Is this a genetic thing? Obviously, there's some genetics to addiction. We know that. Is your ability to recover under certain programs genetic dependent? Is it dependent on what kind of childhood you had, what kind of trauma you have in your past? What are the defining factors that make those 8% that are successful in AA successful and those other 92% not successful? And what dictates what those 46% that'll kick it on their own, why they do it and somebody else doesn't? Yeah, I feel like this science in particular is not immature, but less mature than many other right fields of science. And so they need to just figure out what those parameters are, and then they can do more studies to figure out what, how to optimize the parameters. If you treat AA like school, maybe those 8 percenters are like your A student. Mm-hmm. So you just need like a Jaime Escalante type character to go in and reach that bottom 92% to really get them to learn calculus and quit the habit. <laughs> uh, that'll be Damien. He is the, uh, he's the cock addict version of stand and deliver. Yes, I, I will suck all these dicks so you guys do not have to. All right, let's move right on to Nicotine Patty. Another story that has to do with quitting an addictive substance, a very interesting study was conducted involving nicotine addiction. 
that differentiates by gender. Now, I was not aware of this, but apparently the numbers show that it's much harder for females to kick a nicotine habit than it is for males. I would not have called that. I actually probably would have called the opposite because it seems to me like I see more males utilizing nicotine. But obviously that's anecdotal and not really relevant. But apparently it's, it seems to be statistically much harder if you're a woman to kick a nicotine habit. So what these researchers were doing, and it was very, very interesting, is they decided, you know, nicotine actually affects gut bacteria. More so when it's done, when it's ingesting through your blood, for instance, when you're chewing, when you have a patch, something like that, but also a little bit too when you're smoking. So if nicotine affects your gut bacteria, and we know there is more and more research is coming out literally every week on how gut bacteria affects your whole microbiome, how it affects your mental health, how it affects your dopamine, how it affects uh, different chemicals and hormones in your body, and how important this gut bacteria is. The taste of your stool. There yes. you go. <laughs> oh, God, man, you have been eating right. <laughs> These researchers wanted to see what the effect of nicotine was directly on the gut bacteria. Now, they're not, all, they're not in human trials yet. They're still in mouse studies, and this is a small mouse study. But it's very, very interesting. So what they started with is they got these mice addicted to nicotine by putting nicotine in their water and giving them nicotine-laced water. With comparatively, a small uh, offense compared to the right. other things we do to mice. Yeah, I do think somebody should give an award every year. It's called, like, Best Mouse Torturer. Where they're, like, just... Did it start off with just the cool mice sipping the nicotine water yeah. behind the racquetball courts? Yeah, they were then... wearing little mouse leather jackets. <laughs> so this was a 13-week experiment in which they basically got these mice hooked on this uh, nicotine water. And they found that mice exposed to nicotine, especially the males, had lower concentrates of glycine, serine, and aspartic acid, which could weaken the addictive effects of nicotine. So basically, the nicotine is helping keep itself from getting weak weakened by getting rid of the bacteria that produce things that essentially keep you from getting addicted to nicotine. So it's, it's learning, sounds, like a raptor. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a runaway snowball effect. You know, it's like uh, when you melt the ice up in the northern latitudes because of global warming, and then you release more of the carbon that's trapped in the soil and the ice, and then there's more carbon in the atmosphere, and the cycle keeps it's going. It's a feedback loop. Exactly. So we could solve global warming if everybody stopped smoking. That's what I got from Or, you. Or, according to this research, only did it with their butt. They're seeing a differentiation based on gender of the bacteria in the gut after these studies. Now, again, the sample size is so small that I caution anybody from taking something significant out of this as opposed to just saying, this means we need to do more studies. So why, why are we talking about it? If, if because, nobody should be listening to this. Because, no, nobody should be determining that this means something definitively by itself. But it does hint at a really neat target, which is what a good science does. It shows you another target to throw your, your dart at, and that dart is going to be another study. What they need to do is do a bigger study on this mouse model and then a follow-up study in human trials that looks to see whether or not this gender difference is real and how significant it is. Because some of the bacteria that seem to be expressing themselves differently in the gut would be things that produce chemicals that we think might make it easier or harder to get off nicotine. And so in doing this, we might be finding out that the reason that we have statistically a harder time for females to quit nicotine products is that their gut bacteria responds differently than male gut bacteria and therefore they can't provide the same suppressive chemicals and it's harder for them to get off which means a really really big thing if you're a female who's addicted to nicotine we might be able to solve that with a fecal transplant or otherwise modifying your gut bacteria that's huge news if you're addicted to something which quite frankly will kill you in the end so women who don't smoke there's a market for their fecal for yeah. their feces. Well, actually it would be women who don't smoke and have a preconditioned gut microbiome that produces the chemicals that make it easier to stop smoking. You know how women go into like a sperm bank and look through the catalogs and they say like, well, Harvard educated, <laughs> women are going to start doing this with feces. It's going to be feces banks. Is it just butts? Is that what the catalog is? <laughs> well, a butt model. <laughs> If this turns out to be gut bacteria dependent, I wonder about things like the nicotine patch, because they are saying that this effect on gut bacteria is stronger when it crosses the blood barrier. I'm going to go ahead and say, without looking at any numbers, not scientific, anecdotal, I'm going to go ahead and say, women chew less tobacco than men. I'm just going to make that wild statement. I know it's sexist. I'm going to say women chew less tobacco than men, which is the easiest way to get into your blood which means they're most likely smoking to get that nicotine, which means if they're then trying to quit that and they move to the patch, they're introducing the patch, that nicotine, directly to their blood, which might be negatively affecting their gut microbiome more than the cigarettes themselves. That may mean, again, if more studies show that same type of thing, that it would be better for females trying to quit smoking to maybe avoid things like the patch, which might end up making the situation worse before it makes it better, unless they had one of those sweet fecal transplants from Damien's book. 
Yeah, but not from Davian, please. Yeah. Do not, I would not recommend using my feces <laughs> not, in a transplant. Uh, that is, I think Aristotle once said that. But, but maybe in an art project? Is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah, you, don't, you could draw Jesus with my feces all day. <laughs> Why is it purple? Awards. It's not important. <laughs> art. All right, let's move right on to everybody's favorite game. I call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. All right, I call BS is the game where I read four science news articles, and my panelists compete to see which ones are real and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? Yes. Uh, Bill, you're new. You're uncorrupted. You're being asked to participate in an apartheid government. I am. I am. <laughs> it separates South the, African the dumb native. from the smart. <laughs> and I am asking you to abstain from questions. You can. I. You and I could both well, boycott I, this game. I would like to preface this game by saying that I don't have special powers right. because I'm getting a PhD yeah. and uh, having not actually read any of these studies, uh-huh. I can't actually determine whether they did bad science. I just have to go on my intuition about yes. whether this is reality or not. Just like Damien does, but he always complains because that's what Damien does. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sorry with... about injustices. Go on. <laughs> Article number one. Researchers have discovered a new great ape species, bringing the grand total of great apes, excluding humans, to five. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science because if this was science the inside of your bedroom would be coated in semen. So I'm going to say... What? That doesn't make any sense. More so. Another layer. <laughs> like a finishing, like a... Oh, you're saying because I'd be so excited about yeah. a discovery. You, you would, this type of article would not be pushed back okay. into uh, uh, I Call BS. You're playing the man, not the game. Exactly. All right, and Bill. Uh, I'm going to go with science, but I will also say that I, I happen to have paid attention to the news this week, and I have read this story. All right. Article number two, researchers have announced the development of a universal flu vaccine that would protect against all flus and not just whichever was spreading that year. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science and good news for those of us who were too scared about bird flu to start that forbidden relationship. You didn't get a flu vaccine because you were scared of bird flu? I know that patient zero for AIDS, the guy in Africa, just Uh wanted some delicious meat. Well, I'm just looking for a sweet bird hookup, but I also don't want to be remembered as the biggest asshole in history. Too late. All right, and Bill. Having recently got my flu shot, I hope that this is true, but based on my my knowledge of how flu vaccines work, I'm going to say that it's bad science. All right, article number three. A new analysis of mammoth fossils show that mammoths, like humans, lived in a very sexist society. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science. You could argue the mammoth went extinct because they couldn't find food because the male leading the pack refused to ask for directions. (laughs) He just, you turn left at the glacier. Left at the glacier. Don't tell me. And Bill. Uh, based on the the vagueness of the premise of this question, I'm going to go with uh, science, just because there's room for interpretation. Very good. Article number four. A beluga whale has learned to speak dolphin. Damien, is this science or bad science? If we can teach a gorilla to sign mm-hmm. and to love, mm-hmm. then I have to believe that a dolphin seduced a beluga and... Okay, that wasn't what it was about. It was actually just about language. The but... language was love. Okay, was not... I, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> just, there's an 80s montage of the beluga and the dolphin getting together. John Lithgow was in there telling them not to dance together. Nobody puts Flipper in the corner. Well, that's why sea cows can't speak dolphin, because their love language is touch. They have that's to right. <laughs> That's right. And by the way, they find it very offensive when you call them sea cows. All right, and Bill. <laughs> in the interest of... Uh, uh, no ties. I'm going to go with the... Uh, what did you say again? Science? I'm going to go with bad science. And the, the hypothesis there is that since they're different in size, uh-huh. maybe there's a difference in their, their audible frequencies. Okay. I like that. All right. Uh, let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one. Researchers have discovered a new great ape species, bringing the grand total of great apes, excluding humans, to five. Damien thinks this is false. Bill thinks this is true. And this one is... Bad science. Indeed, researchers did find the discovery of a new species of great ape, that of the orang, but that would bring the grand total without humans to seven because, of course, you have chimps, bonobos, western gorilla, eastern gorilla, Sumatra orangutan, and the Bornean orangutan, and so this would have been the seventh. 
This is another species of orangutan. It's also found on Sumatra, but it is in a very isolated spot. In fact, it's so isolated and away from the rest of the orangs in that area that they didn't even believe this group of orangutans existed until 1997. It's really, really deep in the forest. So they went out and they found them. They've noted before that they have slightly different morphology. They were able to find a skeleton. They found it has very different morphology. And the genetics show that it's actually been separated longer than the other orangutan species, meaning it definitely is its own species, has its own habits, has a genetic differentiation, and has basically been determined to be the Batang Toru orangutan which is the, the area that it comes from and a whole new type. So very, very interesting. We have a whole new species of orangutan. What is the exact distinction that makes something a new species? So this is a very interesting question. We actually get into this a lot with our other physicists uh, on the show because it is somewhat nebulous. You learn in Biology 101 that the difference of a species is whether or not they can mate and produce vi- right. viral it's offspring. It's the whole like, donkey mating mm-hmm. with the horse thing, right? right? The fact of the matter is that is not the definition of species, and it couldn't be once you put some thought into it, because if the idea is any two individuals that can sexually reproduce and create viral offspring as a species, you have a bunch of problems. Number one, the majority of organisms on Earth do not reproduce sexually. They reproduce asexually, so that would mean every bacterium would be its own species. Number two, you have things like hybrids that are viral. So donkeys are not viral. They can't have offspring, except about 0.1% of them can. So what's the statistical cutoff point where you say this percentage is virile, then it's a species, this percentage is, it's not. Then you get into things like ring species where, and there's a great example of a frog that's like this in the United States, where you have four different species of this frog, one along the very west coast, one in the west of center, one east of center, and one along the east coast. Any one of those species can mate with the ones right next to it. So the one on the west coast can meet with the one that's west of center, the one that's west of center can mate with the one that's east of center and the west coast, and the one that's east of center can mate with the east coast and the one that's west of center. But it can't skip over and mate with the other one. So a a west coast frog can't mate with an east coast frog or uh, one on the slight east of center frog. That means that depending on when you saw those two mating or how you saw it, you either would or would not include those all in the same species group. So there's a bunch of different issues with that definition, and it basically gets down to certain arbitrary biological things. But one of the uh, ones that they do use frequently in field biology is not just can two creatures mate and produce feral offspring, but do they? So in this case, they don't. They have genetically been genetically separated for such a long time that they've gone off on their own direction and they, they're considered separate species. We actually see, are in the middle of seeing a speciation event like that happen with the orca, which has different populations of either basically sedimentary pods that stay in one area and nomadic pods that move around. And we can tell from genetic analysis that these two different groups haven't interbred in uh, like 2,000 plus years. And if that continues to go on, it's, no, it's nothing that they can interbreed. You could take the semen from one, put it in another and have a child. They don't interbreed. They choose not to, likely due to culture because they have different songs. If that continues to go on, we might have a speciation event in Orca. All right, on to article number two. Researchers have announced the development of a universal flu vaccine that would protect against all flus, not just whichever was spreading that year. Damien thinks this is true. Bill thinks this is false. And this one is science and it's super interesting so current flu vaccines are targeted basically on an annual basis that whatever flu is being spread in that particular year and it's a guess we have to look at what's going on in southeast asia predict the flu spread when it will come then predict that early on in the year develop a vaccine for that particular flu and then mass produce it in time for the flu season to come around it is a crapshoot And what's even worse about it is if you get that flu vaccine for that specific strain of flu, it is about 60% effective, meaning just over half. Even if it's for the right flu, everything's been done, you got it in time. It's even less effective if it's not the right strain of flu. It's not even worth the autism. (laughs) It is not worth the autism. (laughs) But what researchers are trying to do is develop a vaccine that combines centralized ancestral genes from the four major influenza strains and appears to provide broad protection against the flu at least in the mice studies, which are very small uh, initial mice studies. The study is the first to report the use of multiple centralized HA genes identified using protein sequence analysis programs to provide the greatest level of cross-protective immunity possible. They're going after something that's so basal within flu viruses that it's shared by essentially all flu viruses. They're They're designing their vaccine to go after those particular parts that are so universal that they would apply to literally all the viruses. And the way they did this, by the way, is they immunized mice uh, with this new vaccine type, 
they, as a control, they immunize mice with the old vaccine type for a specific flu virus, and they expose these mice to essentially all the flus. And the ones on the control group all died, and the one, the other ones all survived. So this would be another one of those mouse torture awards that they might be able to give out. Uh, I don't think this dying is a, of a, flu. a new meaning to the the term suicide. Like when you go to the soda fountain and you right. just get all of them. Yeah, get everything. <laughs> if you just put a bunch of flu in the soda machine, then everyone dies. Yeah, it's you know, it's funny. It's like it's a suicide if I'm in the control group. <laughs> It wasn't even real chicken soup they gave the mice in the control group. <laughs> <laughs> What's really interesting is the way they've uh, d- they've been able to deliver this is a whole different type of vaccine. They're not using weakened flu vaccine. They've actually genetically engineered certain adenoviruses, which cause the common cold, to be the vaccine vector delivery system. So it's really neat because it goes after the genes for H1, H2, H3, and H5 influenza strains. And the vaccine isn't capable of causing the cold symptoms. So just like the flu vaccine can't give you the flu, uh, but it's still a safer delivery than influenza uh, vaccines. It's really, really neat. And if effective and found to translate to human models, this could really change things. Because what most people don't realize is we have tens of thousands of deaths from the flu every year in this country. It's actually up there near car accidents in terms of how many people it kills. Yeah, but who does it affect? Primarily old, seniors uh, yes, and... and young people. Young and old are the ones who, di- who die from the flu. But a lot of people get hospitalized from the flu, too. Hospitalized is a big deal. That's a huge drain on the economy, especially when that person who goes into the ER to get hospitalized is contagious, giving it to other people who have impaired immune systems based on the fact that they're in the hospital. So getting rid of the flu would be a huge step up. It would also keep away things like the 1918 flu pandemic when the Spanish flu came in and killed a substantial number of people, killed more people than World War I going on at the same time. And this would protect against even something like that kind of strain. Again, we have to think of avian flu, pig flu, all these things that have the potential to cause a lot of damage, even more so than the regular flu currently does. And this would protect us. So this might be something that changes literally the lives of your children. Spanish flu, Spanish fly, any connection? (laughs) Yeah, you get laid with both. (laughs) Women love a guy puking out of his ass. No, there's just a lot of dead bodies lying around. (laughs) All right, on to article number three. New analysis of mammoth fossils show that mammoths, like humans, lived in a very sexist society. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science. Very interesting that a review of mammoth fossils found that over 70% found in specific traps throughout Siberia. Traps, by the way, not traps made by humans. These natural sink traps that mammoths would get stuck in and then die and, and fossilize. 70% of them were male. That's like quicksand? Vi- uh, you could think of it like quicksand, yeah. Tar pits? Not tar pits, no. Uh, that's very unusual for the fossil record, which is usually pretty much balanced 50-50. The explanation that the author's paper gives is pretty interesting. They theorize that the difference is attributed to the fossilization bias due to social differences in mammoth society. So think of modern-day elephants. Basically, herds of elephants that you see are pretty much all females. So the females and the young live together, and they are led by a really old female, like a matriarch. And then the males, they roam around, kind of like rogue groups. They're rogue male bulls that roam around and try and mate with the the females when they can. That means that those males are not protected as much because if they, let's say, get stuck someplace, they don't have help to get out. But they also have to take riskier chances. They can't just go on their known routes, water hole to water hole, this place to this place, this place to this. They have to roam to try and spread their genes. That would lead them to likely get into more places that are dangerous and therefore die in these fossilization records. Now, I have a few issues with the study. One, the N is only 100. I would like to see a larger N number. The difference at 70%, while statistically significant at the N of 100, is not enough, I think, to conclude that. Number two, one of the things that the author didn't even address is the fact that these are Siberian fossils. A lot of these are found by individuals or amateurs going around. Right now, fossil hunting for Siberian mammoths is a big deal. People are doing this in order to profit. Is it the most dangerous game of all? It is not. Hunting mammoth fossils? It's not even the most dangerous game in Siberia. (laughs) Yeah, it's not nearly as dangerous as Putin insulting, which is a, a dangerous Siberian game. So one of the reasons people go out and search for these fossils in Siberia is because they can make a profit. They can make a lot of money by selling them. The most expensive part of it, and the part that everybody wants when they're buying these on the illicit black market, is the tusks, which are much larger in male specimens. So what we might be seeing is that difference of 70% male specimens might be reflective of the fact that fossil hunters out there, illicit black market fossil hunters, 
are more interested in the male specimens with the large tusks and therefore might not be looking for the female specimens as much, we might be seeing a reporting bias as opposed to an actual fossilization bias. What would a mammoth baculum run me? A uh, mammoth bacula? Uh, well, you want the penis bone? I, I, don't, I don't know that they have that. That was an ape thing. I don't know that the mammoths have it. Gotcha. So I can't add it to my gorilla baculum no, collection? No, no, you cannot. <laughs> And lastly, article number four, a beluga whale has learned to speak dolphin. Damien thinks this is true. Bill thinks this is false. And this one is science, meaning that Damien is both a winner and a complete asshole. Because Damien Damien decided, Bill's first day, Bill's going to come out, he's going to have some fun, tell some jokes with us. (laughs) Damien decides, oh, I know, I'll get a perfect the day Bill's here, because I want to just rub it in, because I'm a cheater who likes to impose mean things on guests that come by to very genuinely give us their time and effort. Damien? How would you react <sighs> if Bill or any other scientist had gotten the perfect? Would you, yeah. would you admonish them? No, for, because for it's, it's his kids? first day, Damien. It's his first day. I have a learning disability. If, I am being, if, if anything, he should be more ashamed. You Denzel Washington training date him. You, you gave him some PCP. You put a gun to his head. You made him do some <laughs> fucked up shit, and then you dropped him off with some cholos with a blender. I am more like Sean Penn in My Name is Sam <laughs> and Tom Hanks in Philadelphia. First of all, it's I am Sam. All right. Uh, indeed, it did happen. It happened in Crimea, ironically, the second Russian story of I Call BS, where a beluga was put in a tank with a bunch of bottlenose dolphins. Immediately after the beluga arrived, they started doing sound recordings of the whole group swimming together. And two months later, they let the beluga into a separate pool for a few dozen brief recording sessions. They made more recordings nine months after that for a total of more than 90 hours of audio. So they had a pretty good amount to look through. This isn't just a quick turn the tape recorder on and see what, what happens. Did they, pretty dry. Did they start this investigation with a hypothesis or do they just throw these things together I think and they see did what it, happens? I think they did it with at least a let's see what happens, but probably a hypothesis of let's see how this beluga... Now, the thing about belugas, which I didn't know when I started this, um, I always knew belugas were kind of an interesting cetacean in that it's the only one with a neck. Um, you know, none, none of the other whales have necks if you think of like an orca or something, but a beluga has this head that it can turn around just like ours and it's white and it's just a really weird different creature. I guess I didn't realize this, belugas are excellent at making sounds they mimic sounds with their group they have very very complex languages in their group when they're raised around humans they actually try and mimic human speech which is really interesting so this is probably what made them think hey let's throw a recording in when we put them in with these dolphins my ventriloquism act could really take off with a beluga act (laughs) that's right next jeff dunham uh and the beluga's first day in the dolphin pool she gave calls typical for her species so she was speaking beluga But slowly, as they went on, as they continued to analyze the recordings, the beluga started adapting to what the bottlenose dolphins were saying and basically making the same calls, the same clicks, the same noises, until it became essentially indistinguishable. As a proof of concept, they actually had dolphin researchers sit there with some headphones on, listen to the calls, and they could not tell which one was the beluga. But what about the dolphins? Like, were there any behavioral differences once it could start speaking the language? And like, that would could be they an, start swimming together? Yeah, or that would be an interesting tie, because you have to think, though, it would be a little bit hard to gauge when you got this thing in a, what is essentially a big bathtub. You know, of course they're swimming together. There's no other place to swim, you know? Sure, yeah. uh, prefer mackerel over herring, though. Right, yeah. it's... But we are saying that the language changes, means that there's an adaptable language. We've seen some kind of hints at this with some other cetaceans before, but this is the first time where it's gone to the point where an actual dolphin researcher can listen to these dolphins talking and can't tell that there's a beluga whale in there. And when you tell them there is a beluga whale, which one do you think it is? They're like, fuck if I know. So belugas are much better at learning the dolphin language than dolphin researchers are at learning the dolphin language. That's exactly what I was getting at. All right. Well, congratulations, Bill, on coming and having a very successful show on what I could consider, in a way, a win in I Call BS. In what way? In what way would you consider (laughs) it a win? He was much nicer than you. He didn't try and show off on the first day, and he brought up a lot of good points. You are rewarding me- mediocrity and failure <laughs> and punishing my excellence. I would say it's anything but mediocrity. I got them all wrong, correct? No, you got one right. One right. So really, if anything, it's excelling at failure. That's true. He is excellent at it, Damien. You, should, you got a thing or two to learn. I'm going to petition for a doctorate degree from UCSD, <laughs> and this is going to be a big part of the evidence. All right. And thank you, audience, for coming back for Science Faction 199, where you learned about Paranthropus boisei, the interesting statistics behind rehab... Why it might be harder for a woman than a man to quit nicotine. How a new great ape species was discovered. How we might soon have a universal flu vaccine. How mammoths lived in a sexist society. 
and how a beluga learned to speak dolphin. Thank you so much for joining us. Please rate us on iTunes. Please subscribe. Please tell your friends. This campaign is going so well. We, the numbers are amazing. We cannot thank you guys enough. And come on back next week for Science Faction 200. Women be shopping. Am I right, fellas? You know what else women be doing? Having a tougher time statistically quitting smoking than men. Am I right, fellas? You've been listening to Science Faction. That's not right.